Today we have an online workshop. That means there is some interactive elements in the workshop today. And the topic is why and how to document your workflow. Uh, we do have, let me just check on this chat real quick to make sure that people, can we see? Ah, yes. Um, that is a point I will, I will address. Let me just move through this. Um, so today, our table of con contents includes concepts as such as what is a workflow and why do workflows need to be documented? And my particular contribution, the great British science off what and how to document and when to stop documenting. So we'll be going through all of these moving forward. What is a workflow? Broadly, a workflow is an ordered series of actions that produce an outcome. Now you can do that workflow and not document it at all and what order those actions happened in and exactly what actions will be lost to time. Most of our workflows are lost to time. You know, we don't actually write down maybe the, the steps we took in a day. Did we drop something in the post first or did we, you know, go to the shop and, and pick up a pint of milk or did we do it the other way? It doesn't really matter because we don't need to reproduce that specific outcome most of the time. But in the scientific or research context, a workflow is all the details and ordered steps that allow another researcher to produce your same outcome. So it's really unlikely that someone else would need to produce your random Wednesday. So they don't care whether you dropped off something in the post or picked up the milk first. But if you're trying to get someone else to reproduce your same scientific you know, results, it does matter that they be able to reproduce your workflow. So just, you know, broadly, a couple of concepts there. This will probably sound quite intuitive and you think, of course, why are you telling me this? Because uh, allowing other researchers to produce your same outcome is, is known as reproducibility or sometimes known as replicability. And it is a key part of the scientific method. Despite this, there has been a huge problem in um, social sciences and medicine particularly, and has become known as the crisis of reproducibility because huge swathes of people for decades now have not been documenting their workflows well enough and no one can, can find that they get the same answers when they do a study or they do a, you know experiment or an intervention or they, they do some kind of obs observational series. They're getting completely different outcomes and everyone's saying like, well, if you got A and I got B, what does that mean we should do? Nobody knows. It's all very panicked. Everyone's having a flap. So here we are today trying to fix the world. Yeah, so Pusheen is sad about this crisis of reproducibility. Um, so there you go. It is proof that I like cats because I've put a cartoon one in my presentation. Now, specifically, why should scientists document their workflows? Now, you know, it allows other scientists to reproduce, validate or extend the work. That's that's quite important for the scientific method. It also helps others to understand the work and its results. They may have absolutely no interest in reproducing your work but it does help them understand it if they can really get the steps that you took to get your result. Uh, and it contributes to trust in the work and its results. If everyone understands and feels like they could reproduce your results if, they've, if they wanted to, they're more likely to trust you, to trust your outcomes, to trust like the conclusions that you produce. And it turns out trusting people is important to working together. Eh, I don't know, society, eh? And particularly from my perspective, it promotes a culture of open science in which people are honest with each other about how they did the thing, what results they got, you know, why it matters, why they made their choices. It means we're not all sneaking around trying to get one over on the other guy and, you know, being really duplicitous and, and you know, underhanded. I mean, you, you can do that if you want, but it's not great for science as a whole. You think, but why should I document my workflows? Obviously, I trust myself. Well, work well-documented workflows makes for a really easy method section. 
most papers or chapters or dissertations or theses or anything that you go to write as, as a researcher require a method section. And if you wait right up until just before you're submitting the thing to write your method section, you're going to get panicked and flappy and not know what to put in there. And actually, what did I do first? And where was that set of data from the one uh, website or from the other? Oh, God. So if you want an easy way to write your method section, document your workflow. Um, also, documenting your workflow helps you remember and understand your own work better, which is very important if someone corners you at a conference and asks you a specific question. It is deeply undermining of your own sort of confidence in your research. If someone asks you something and you think, oh, crap, I have no idea what I did, actually. I didn't write it down. I haven't spent any time thinking to myself about what I did. I'm going to create a distraction and run away. It's not great for your career or, or networking or even just your own confidence. And this is from my particular um, particular sort of focus. If you have documented your workflows very, very well, it is a fast and easy way to identify and correct errors because you can look back and say, oh, wait, I did things differently in these two parts. I'll just fix that one and rerun it. You can incorporate new or different data. So let's say you have a very good process for how you worked with the data from that website. Someone has given you a new data set. You think, oh, I'll just do the exact same thing in the exact same order to the new data. Great. You know, really a good for parity. Helps you rerun tests or recreate images if you think, actually, I need to um, like recreate images, for example. Maybe you want to create a... Um, colorblind friendly image because your first image was really hard to see. Well, if you have all the steps that you took to get your original image, it's very easy to do all those steps again, get a new image. And of course, you can apply your work to a new topic area or, you know, a new set of data, a new concept, a new, you know, collaborative effort. It's much easier to do if you have it all written down, you can share it with your partners, you can, you know, see how it slots in with the new topic generally good idea to know what you've done if you want ever want to do it again. And there's probably a lot more possibilities for why you know every individual person should document their own workflows. Um, but realistically, a workflow comes from keeping very good records of what you did, all the data that you used, including the source and the version and when you got it, all the processes you employed, the decisions you made, the analyses you ran, the tools you used, the visualizations you chose, and much more. Now, that might seem like a phenomenal amount of headache. You think like, oh, God, can't people just do whatever and like believe me when I say a thing? Well, ideally, we would like that, but it's not the way the world works. Right. So I'm going to talk to you next about how the Great British Bake Off illustrates reproducibility quite well, specifically the technical challenge round. I don't know if you are um, fans of the Great British Bake Off. I'm going to assume you are because lots of people are. Um, even if you're not actually a fan, you don't watch the show, you're probably at least aware of it because it's kind of big cultural phenomenon. And the technical challenge is... Um, where contestants have to produce a perfect example, you know, like the same thing of an ideal classic recipe, often a recipe that they have never made before, maybe never even heard of before. It's, it's quite, you know, it really throws a spanner in the works of people who are confident in their baking skills to suddenly be asked to produce a perfect thing that they've never even heard of. And importantly, they, ha they have to produce this perfect thing with vague instructions. They do have identical ingredients, but maybe not everything that they're given will be needed. They do have equivalent equipment, but again, maybe they're given choices. You know, do I use the round cookie cutter or the, you know, person-shaped cookie cutters, things like that. They don't know the right way. And of course, there's a fixed time limit. Now, for the Great British Bake Off, uh, this produces quite a lot of comedy as people produce, you know, things that are sliding sideways off a plate when they should be standing up in a particular shape or they're, they're the wrong color or the, the wrong texture or the, the wrong, 
who knows what else. And the reason it's funny is because they're being asked to do a thing. They're being asked to reproduce something that they don't know how to do with a really bad set of instructions. <laughs> now, of course, the bake-off would be much less entertaining if the technical round had perfect instructions, took out all the guesswork. Um, but, you know, in contrast, science in an ideal world would seek to remove all that guesswork through well-documented workflows. So this is, you know, just briefly a sort of comedy interpretation of why a well-documented workflow might be important. I mean, certainly Bake Off contestants would probably prefer a better, uh, a less vague recipe. So you can kind of think of your documented workflows as making the best recipe that you can so that other people can reproduce your scientific cake. I don't know. The metaphor is a bit strange there. But let's start with the interaction. So uh, now we're going to move into Mentimeter for the next bits. And that means I will ask you to enter, you know, answers to questions or suggestions or sort of short answers into uh, your second device. If you have a second device or this device, you know, the same one that you're using Zoom on, you can switch between screens. So let's get interactive. What are some of the things you do in your work that need to be documented? You know, so um, I believe you should be able to answer short answers for this up to three. So just tell me a couple of things like, do you interview participants or do you create online surveys or do you um, it may be use sensor data or you know maybe you go and do some interesting observations yeah classic data analysis all of us do data analysis and while that might seem you know everyone knows in theory how to do data analysis the specific analysis you did you know oh we've got a question on the what is the mentimeter login again um Sorsha, if you want to pop the details back in it's m-e-n-t-i dot com and then there's an eight digit code that I think Sorsha will be able to share again. Yeah, good one. Literature search, because, you know, what what are the keywords that you used when you did your literature? You know, how did you get this set of literature and decide it was worth you know searching? That's a really subtle one. People don't think about literature search as something that you need to document, but you do. Um, data exclusions. That's a good one. Yeah. Why, why do you keep this person, but exclude that one from, from your data set? Transcribing interviews. Good, good one. That's very clear. Um, you know, do you use software to do it? Did you pay a particular service? You know, how did you record the interviews? You know, what, what kind of files are they in? All of this stuff is potentially quite important. Okay. Uh, shadowing. I'm not sure. Oh, oh, you mean like um, following someone around while they do things. So that's a, an observational process. That's, yeah, that's really hard for someone else to replicate because they'll never be able to go back in time and shout at the same person on the same day. But as clear as you can about why you selected the person to shadow, what the context of shadowing was, you have to write all this down so that they can at least try and approximate something. Okay, a lot of good, good stuff here. We're clearly from the set of answers that are coming through social scientists for the most part. I think no one here is talking about like, you know, digitally simulating the movement of ions or something. But this is all the more important because it is social science that had some of the biggest crises of reproducibility. You know, people were just absolutely producing sort of an analysis of, of maybe survey data and nobody else was able to get anything remotely close to the same analysis to come out of, of service that they thought were, were doing the same thing. So people got really confused and like, are you making your data up? Are you excluding people and not telling me why? You know, all kinds of things. Focus groups, that's a good one as well. How do you select? What's the context of in which they're, you know, the meeting and, you know, what kind of prompts are they given? You have to have to be very clear about all of that. So really good stuff here. And it's clear that we don't all have the same documentation needs. 
documenting a literature search is going to be very different than documenting how you shadow someone. They both need to be documented, but exactly what you need to document and how detailed you need to be, that's, that's going to vary. So don't worry about it too much if it's not immediately obvious how you do all the different things. Okay, Hannah is still not seeing the code. I believe it's 3009 was the first. Uh, let me see if I can go back up. It is 3009-8964. Hopefully, there we go, yes. Uh, got, some, got some good answers there. Thank you, uh, Ahmad. So let's move back in. So these, clearly there's a lot of, we, we know there's these things that we should be documenting. It's not always obvious how to document them the best. And that's why you're here. So let's talk for a moment how you would document these things. You know, your, your first instincts, and we can talk about whether uh, later on, we'll talk a little bit whether those first instincts scale up or apply to different contexts or whether there's maybe um, a particular software tool that will help you do that better and things like this. So please do not worry. No one can tell who answers what in this context. So you can answer absolutely anything you want. Uh, you can say, you know, I document my literature search by taking screenshots of my Google search. You know, okay. That's, that's one way. Maybe you document your surveys by um, just sort of saving a link to the online survey in, you know, some kind of um, online survey data set. Maybe you document how you exclude people from, yeah, make a table in Word, classic, classic. And you are not alone in doing that because a lot of us are told that tables are a good way to present information in a, a ready form. And that's true. And uh, in Word, because lots of people like to use Word. <laughs> Ooh, got some. Excel spreadsheets, methods in a Word document, Stata do files. Okay, that's a good one. That's a good one. Written notes, statistical code, PDF of surveys, keeping a diary. Okay, so we've got some good variety coming in. This is great. Audio recordings, super. Bullet points, transcriptions. Okay, yeah, we've got some great options coming in. And you'll see that these are more or less appropriate to different kinds of things. So, you know, it makes a lot of sense to keep the audio files if you record a, you know, semi-structured interview with someone. Obviously, you might also want to keep the transcription that you produce from that audio recording. You can keep them both. Those are good. Um, bullet points. I kind of, that one's a good one. I like that because it, to me, that re reminds me of bullet journals. And you can sort of, on any given day that you're doing research, list out the things you think you're going to do that day. And then at the end of the day, you review them and say, did I do this thing? No. If not, why not? If I did the thing, how did it go? Where did I you know, store the file? Something like that. So bullet points, certainly like a bullet journal or keeping a diary, that's also written there. These are really good ways for you as a researcher for your own well-being to document your word, your word flow. On the other hand, the Stata do files, and you know, there's another one about sort of uh, coding, you know, things like that. You know, saving your your codes, statistical codes. This is great because these are things you can really share as they are, that someone else can use your same code on your same data, and inarguably they will get your same results. And that is a very useful, very clear very trustworthy way of making sure that someone else can look in under the hood, you know, of your, your research and say like, Oh, what's going on? What did they do? Great. I love that. Uh, write methods as you go along. That is a great one because absolutely what you think you're doing and what you actually do and what you decide three weeks later, you're going to do instead. <laughs> You kind of want to keep track of all of this because the reason you might make a change in three weeks, you want to document why you made that change, why you changed your mind, what decisions you're making, and whether you change those decisions later. This is great. Um, so we also see a lot of people are, you know, tables and spreadsheets and, you know, um, sort of that you're kind of thinking of not only how you're going to record these things, but how you're going to let other people see what you've recorded. And you might be 
blending the, the two points, but they're not totally separable. So another one we've got on here is cloud. And I assume that means like cloud sharing your, your research points. You know, you can put your data sets and your statistical code and your, you know, maybe research meeting notes in a Dropbox folder and share it with someone else who wants to, who joins your project later on. So we're kind of mixing both um, how you document things and how you make your documentation available. They're not totally separable. It is important to keep that in mind. So, but they're, they're, not, they're not totally the same as well. So you might be really confident that you're doing a great job of documenting things because you're putting all your notes in a um, Dropbox folder. But how are you actually writing those notes as well? How are you making it clear? How are you dating the files? Things like that. So there's lots more to cover and we'll carry on. Just want to take a moment to move through the questions. Um, so let's see. Let me clear out some of these that have been answered. Great. Um, any tips for keeping up momentum on documenting workflow? I always start out with great intentions, but suffer for attenuation of effort over time. You and me both. Um, I mean, making your documentation available to other people is a good way to motivate you to not have terrible documentation <laughs> because, you know, it's a little bit like you maybe get more work done if you're working in a cafe instead of in your own home, because in a cafe, you, other people are looking at you and you thinking like, oh, I've got to look properly serious here as I'm typing up things. You're not, you know, randomly having a, a, a coffee while folding your laundry and, you know, catching up on your Netflix, you know, queue. Like the idea that other people are looking can be very good motivation for, for doing something well. Um, we will cover some other uh, sort of um, topics about uh, advice for each other, but I think that's a great one. Um, great. So let's move on to the next slide. Again, is, this is part of the interactive element, so, so please do keep your comments coming. Okay, this one's a little bit more about decisions, and I've covered this a little bit, but what are some of the decisions you make that you need to document? And this might be something that you will have thought about because you've been reading someone else's research and you're trying to replicate what they're doing, and you realize you've come to a decision and you have no idea what they did, and you don't know how to do, how to move forward. So anytime you have some of those, I mean... Um, excluding participants, that's a decision. Um, you know, uh, eliminating outliers from your statistical analyses, that is a decision and you need to document how many outliers you removed and why, you know, what cutoff point did you use? What effect did it have on your um, analyses? Some things like that. So go ahead and share some of the decisions that you are aware of in your research that you might need to document or that you wish other people would document. Ethical considerations, that's great. That's a really good contribution, yeah. Whether or not you ask these people or those people, how you phrase the questions, how you, um, you know, what, what setting maybe you meet in so that the, the participants feel safe or, um, you know, not overheard or something like that. These are, these are some very good decisions that you have to make around different kinds of things. Also, of course, if you have to do an ethical um, approval for your research, that's a good way to document your ethical considerations and one that is quite formal. Um, unfortunately, I think eth actually getting your ethical you know, decisions documented formally in an approval is a bit of a back and forth process. So you might want to think about you know, how you, um, document the changes. But yeah, good choice. Which database accessed? Okay. Data to include or exclude. Choice of analysis method. That is brilliant. Software to use. Data cleaning. Excel criteria. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, these are all good. These are all really good. And they show that you are aware that these decisions are out there. And that um, if you were to try and replicate someone else's answer, you know, someone else's research, you would come to these questions and think like, 
how do I do this? Because it's not clear how they did what they did. Yeah, I mean, some of these decisions, there isn't a right or a wrong answer necessarily, like geographical regions that's just been included. If your research is about, you know, comparing London and um, Tokyo on some maybe health metric or something like that, then it's it's clear why you're comparing London and Tokyo. But you have to say, actually, how do I define London? Is it these boroughs in central London? Is it everywhere that is within five miles of a tube stop? You know, is it, um, you know, am I using someone else's definition of what counts as London and not London and I'm just ad adopting theirs? However, you make that choice and there's no real right or wrong way to, to make that choice. You need to document why you made it the way you did. And if you're borrowing someone else's decision, you know, if you're using the, I don't know, ONS definition of what counts as London, then you know, link to that. Good. Ethnicity, that's a good one. That's a very hairy one because, you know, maybe everyone has different ideas of what counts as ethnicity. Is it self-reported identity? And then is it really free text or are you trying to put people in boxes? That's a tricky one. Yeah. Very good to, to document properly. Right. Okay. Data cleaning. That's a very processed decision. You know, am I going to recode these variables into um, yes or no? Or am I going to recode this free text field into, you know, maybe five discrete factors, something like that? Those, those are really good uh, decisions that they, they can feel very practical. I have to recode these variables because otherwise I can't use this free text field in my analysis. Okay, great. It's a practical choice. Highlight that it's a practical reason. But then you have to decide if I recode this variable into five factors or 10 factors or however it is, you know, what, what made me choose the factors that I chose? Power dynamics. That's a great one. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, that is a minefield for, for documentation, but it is, I mean, that's one of the reasons why documenting decisions is so important. Okay, so some great answers here. Um, how frequently do you think you should document the decisions you make? And I've given some answers here. And this is, this is really just gut instinct. Should you be doing this daily, weekly, monthly, immediately after making a decision? It depends on the context because, frankly, what in life does not depend on the context? Yeah. Daily. Ooh. Ooh, we've got some, uh, some keen documenters. It depends. Yeah, I'm with I'm with you on the it depends. <laughs> weekly. OK, OK. OK, again, there is no right answer to this, and it probably depends on your specific research immediately after making them feels like a right answer. But in fact, that will be very hard to hold yourself to in a, um, a, a consistent way because we're not always aware that we have made a decision after we've made a decision. Um, so it's probably somewhere between, I would say immediately after making them and then maybe daily or weekly or monthly, depending on the pace of your research, that you kind of check in with someone else on your team. These are all the decisions I think I've made. Can you spot any that I've missed? You know, so there's, there's a kind of a back and forth. There's not a purely like always do it this way. That is not how life goes. Um, okay, so yeah, monthly. I, I like monthly. Monthly seems like very doable. And uh, I, if it's research that you've done a lot, like you've, you've developed a particular process and you've applied it to one group and it worked out well and you made a couple of little changes, applied it to another group, worked even better, no further changes, applied it to a third group, you're probably reducing the number of decisions that you're making regularly at which point you can probably space out the frequency with which you sit down consciously to document your decisions. So yeah, no right or wrong answers here, but I'm glad to see that everyone is so keen. <laughs> Keenness will be rewarded. Okay, and here's another one that you're probably aware of, and it's, it's a bit of a shame that the slide has gone a bit squiffy like this. How do you document the ideas that influence your work? Because we all have brilliant ideas, maybe just before falling asleep, we record a note to ourselves, you know, note to self. 
do the thing better. Um, but what influenced the idea, you know, what, what caused us to have these new things, ooh, checklists. Um, and, you know, you can read pop science magazines or you know, maybe listen to podcasts, a crazy idea crosses your mind. Um, I don't know if you, if you follow like Times Higher Education blog series or The Conversation or something like that, there's lots of ideas in there that probably um, influence your work. But I'll bet most of us do not ever cite podcasts and blogs and, you know, the, the kind of random conversations we have in a pub. <laughs> Those don't go into our reference system. <laughs> you know? um, oh, yeah, exactly. I mean, um, whoever's uh, answer is highlighted in red here is that they don't have a good system for this, but they would love to have one. Absolutely true. Because, I mean, this is, this is one of the challenges is that we, every moment of our lives contributes to the way we move throughout our life in the future. So, you know, whether you go this way or that way, when you're walking your dog in the morning may lead you to see someone's um, doing something that then gives you an idea that you use in your research. And it's really strange to say, you know, to put in your citations. Uh, I had this idea while walking my dog. That's probably, it doesn't seem very professional. It's realistic, but it is not professional. So we kind of need a way of like keeping track of all of our ideas and sorting them out or reframing them so that um, people don't think we're crazy for citing our dog as a motivation. That said, put your dog in the acknowledgements of your work if you like. It's fine. So this is this is an interesting one. Yeah, I personally, um, I have a lot of notes. I sort of capture... I, I use tools like um, Evernote or um, sort of, I guess there's a Keep is the Google equivalent. And then there's like Samsung Notes or something. They let you save websites and take pictures and include that as well, or audio recordings or all these things. And they kind of just chuck it into a big pot. And then on a regular basis, I go through that pot of things that I've saved, like notes to self. And I sort them into categories or I throw them out if they're really just, you know, if there's nothing there. So you kind of want to develop an, a way to keep all the things that cross your mind quickly and easily. And then you need a frequency with which you look at those things that cross your mind and either throw them away or take action on them. This is a little bit, it's known as the GTD method, the get things done method, in which you give yourself an easy way to just brain dump, but then you set yourself um, a pattern with which you sort through the brain dump mining for good ideas. And yeah, it could be checklists. It could be Evernote if you're, or, or keep notes or whatever if you're into that could be a document on your your computer could be you know a set of audio recordings on your mobile screenshots and and sort of web links and things that's a good one because there's so much good structure built into a web link or a sc screenshot that lets you quickly save that information and while it's easy enough to do something like that on your own it's this is a very difficult one to collaborate with. So you don't necessarily want other people throwing stuff into your brain dump pile because you won't know what they're talking about. When you go to look at, at their picture, you're like, it's just a picture of, you know, a path. I don't know what I'm supposed to be looking at here, but for them, they were like, oh, this is about access issues and how wide the paths are and whether this seems safe for people you know, it, whatever their research focus might be. So this is a tricky one. And this highlights both the importance of documenting, but the importance of having different documentation systems for different contexts. You probably want to document your own ideas slightly differently than the way you and a research partner document collaborative ideas on a particular project. That said, if you get good at the GTD method, the get things done method of brain dump, periodically sort through the dump, 
you can implement that with the team so that you maybe you have a weekly or bi-weekly meeting, at which point you say, all right, everyone, let's go through all the th- bookmarks we've saved to this, this particular shared folder. Let's chuck out ones that are useless. Let's assign ones that are, are potentially something to different people and put, you know, dates uh, by when they'll they'll decide what to do with that. It does seem like a lot of work, I will grant you. All right, here's another one, and everyone will have different answers. How do you get your data? Do you take videos of people as they move through a supermarket and sort of look at whether they're moving fast or slow or what their posture is? You know, maybe maybe you're doing research on how people move in a shared space. Do you have sensors uh, set up across the city to monitor air quality? Do you... Uh, apply to maybe an app, you know, and see like how many people are performing yoga every day. Interviews, surveys, questionnaires, all classic social science examples. That's great. Interviews mostly. Okay. I imagine a lot of you will be doing interviews and surveys or, or questionnaires, the kind of classic social science methods. Of course, there are well-established repositories with the UK data service that have good interview data already prepared in a downloadable file. So maybe you get your data by downloading someone else's interview data, perfectly valid. But think a little bit more beyond that. Maybe what if, and maybe this will be a bit uh, abstract, but in an ideal world, where would you get your data? Like maybe some kind of direct brain transfer, but that's a bit specious. Maybe it'd be more interesting if you could have maybe a device, an app on someone's phone, and you would be able to track how often they opened their phone or how often they moved to certain parts of the city or something like that. So you can, life stories, that's an interesting one. Oh, um, yeah, maybe, maybe you get, I, I worked with someone who was really interested in lost objects So her data was photographing things that were like in the street. (laughs) That's a very unusual kind of data source, maybe compared to to what you're used to. But in her case, it was, yeah, images and objects, well, objects and images of objects that had been lost in the street. Public primary or secondary data collection, books, journals, websites, interviews, surveys, observation. It's great. So this, this brings up a good point, primary and secondary data. And you don't have to, you're obviously much more responsible for documenting how you got primary data. Secondary data has a different kind of documentation. You kind of just say, I downloaded it from this website on this date. (laughs) Or, you know, I accessed the Twitter API using these search terms and this kind of access level. And I got so many results, you know. So there's a clear distinction here between how much effort and sort of mental clarity needs to go into well-documented primary data collection as opposed to secondary data collection. Uh, Research papers, focus groups, transcripts, questionnaires, apps, websites, government publications. That is a lot of data. And if you are using all of those together in one project, I do not envy you your methods section. Um, But it's good that you're aware that they all (laughs) have different provenance and that they need to be documented. So in this case, um, it's a little bit, yeah, how do you get your data? It's quite an abstract question in some ways, especially in the reproducibility aspect, because things like interviews or, um, you know, shadowing someone or sort of observing a, a particular day and what happened, this is not something that can be reproduced. So we need to make sure that we document properly all the data that we have, how representative it is maybe, uh, you know, how we got it and why we made all the decisions. In this case, especially for primary data collection, absolutely justify document as much as possible. Secondary is much easier. And that's why I mostly work with secondary data. Um, So here's a good one. How do you document your data acquisition? So if you 
do surveys, for example, have you ever stopped and, and put down on paper your process for finding people to, to interview? Um, or if you take pictures of objects that are found in the street, do you record your walk, you know, on some kind of like um, pedometer app and, you know, geotag your date, the pictures or something like that? So there's some some very complex concepts here. And you don't have to be honest if, if it's too uncomfortable to talk about how you document your own data acquisition. Imagine a theoretical research project or, or think of a research project done by someone else and think about how they data documented their data acquisition. Because I realize it's quite uncomfortable sometimes to be confronted with the fact that I never wrote down how I got those survey participants. <laughs> Maybe it's just advertising with a 10, 10 quid voucher, shopping voucher. Okay. Um, for data analysis, his question has been su submitted. You have to document straight away. Otherwise you can't remember exactly what you did. Too many tiny nuances. This is absolutely true. Yeah, it, this is, I mean, this is probably why we're, we're struggling to answer this question about how you document your data acquisition because um, yeah, it's it really near impossible to think back like three months to when you did something and try and write down what you did. So yeah, this is, in this case, this is a real clear um, thumbs up for the idea of documenting frequently and immediately. Uh, in academic research, is it okay to reference podcasts or videos? I would say absolutely. Um, it's no, to my mind, it's it's not fundamentally any different than referencing um, like a magazine article. They're a bit pop culture, but that doesn't mean that they're not interesting and useful sources of information. So yeah, I would say if you're using a podcast or or a video or something like that as as an influence on your research, yeah, go ahead, reference it. If you're using it as a data source, absolutely reference it. In fact, maybe record a, a save, um, a file of it in a cloud repository so that other people can access it. Kind of depends um, on what you're using it for. If you're influencing your ideas, yeah, you can, you can reference it um, in the, the citations list. If you're using it as a data set, yeah, really very clearly, you know, save recordings of it, save where you downloaded it from and on what date, you know, put it in some kind of cloud repository so that other people can access it. Yeah, I've got another suggestion here, the ethics application and ongoing documentation in the methods section. Absolutely, the ethics application will be a very useful thing uh, for documenting how you got your data, you know, because you have to deliberately think about who am I inviting to participate? How will I manage their participation? You know, am I doing this in a way that is consistent and safe and um, comfortable and things like that? So yeah, this is, um, I think the, the, the lack of answers here is, is a little bit telling on, yeah, how little tools are given to us when we start out doing research on how to properly document workflows. So let me, I think I'm about to go into some of the tools that I use specifically. Um, yeah, okay. So just as a summary, uh, well-documented workflows can include, depending on your research, the details of your data, including the source, the volume, any descriptive statistics, representativeness, these kinds of things. The data processes, how you stored your data, how you recoded any variables, whether you linked more than one data set, and if so, how you linked them, whether you anonymized the data, any analysis you ran, things like that. Step by step of any experiments you ran or observations you made or models that you built and changed. Uh, descriptions of any materials, software, et cetera, that are used. 
uh, the digital resources if you have them. So if you have the raw data files or final data files or synthetic data versions, if you have code written, you know, the stata do files, things like that. Uh, if you have R files and also the justifications for any decisions, um, these, these might be reference lists. So you might say so-and-so 20 years ago made his decision this way and I'm going to steal it exactly, just use his same decision. Theories, frameworks, written explanations, anything else that's relevant for your work. So the ethics applications, for example. Now it's all well and good to say, oh yeah, document all of this, you know, do your best, it'll be great. But that's difficult. So let's talk specifics here. Um, here are my, my major tips are make conscious decisions as early as possible. And it's very difficult to make conscious decisions. So you might want to have like meetings in which you double check the decisions that you think you've made with your research partner or supervisor, or, you know, even just a buddy who's working on a different project and helps you sanity check what you're doing as early as possible. So write them all down, check in on a regular basis, but be realistic. We will not be able to document absolutely everything we do unless we have a camera following us around the whole time, big brother style. You know, there are subtleties to how we make decisions, how we incorporate new information, how, how that changes our mind that we cannot really share. We do our best, but ultimately, you know, if you're writing a recipe for the technical challenge of a, a Bake Off episode, you have to decide what to include and what to leave out. You know, you might say include two eggs. You don't say uh, in two, include two eggs with exactly this weight and color and from this farm. Um, automate where possible. So this is probably the trick that I think a lot of you are talking about um, tips on actually automating things. And that's great. I'll get into that. Um, and here's, here's some of the things that I want to talk about specifically, including automate, automation. So if you're manual citations and references, do not do manual citations and references. I beg you not to do this manually. First of all, it is a nightmare of formatting styles and double checking to make sure your reference list mass matches with everything that you cite in the paper and then back. You are much better to use referent management software. My personal favorite is Bibtech because I write papers in uh, LaTeX, but I have used Mendeley. I find it very easy. Uh, I have used Mendeley and EndNote together if I'm working in a Word document. And Zotero is a bit like Mendeley as well. Mendeley and Zotero, what they do is it's a sort of, you can get a little button in your browser bar that lets you save a website or a paper or a PDF or something like that that you found through a browser to a repository of references. You can then export a list of all those references and put it into a document like a Word document. And then as you're going through, you think, oh, this idea, I got it from that paper. And you can click to add a reference, a citation from your supported list. If this is interesting to you, if you want more clear, specific workshops on how to use like citations and reference management software, do let me know. Um, I will happily talk through my personal favorite, Bibtech as well as things like EndNote, which are maybe a bit more accessible for people that use Word. Now, another version, and we're all, an, another concept, and we're all guilty of this, is when you save files under different versions. So you might have like draft one, draft one underscore two, uh, draft two, draft two final, draft two final with edits, draft two final with edits and new you know, images. This is terrible. It, it will clog up your files. It will be a nightmare. You will never remember what's going on. And if you're working with anyone else, they have no idea what's going on either. A better way to do this is version control software. And you can explicitly upload a, like the, the final version for a day, for whatever day you're working on your project to version control software like Git or uh, SVN or something like that. But even Microsoft Office 365 includes version control software. 
What this means is you can roll back whatever version you have open, your one file. You can roll back to pre previous versions, sort of like tracking changes, but without keeping separate files for each change. It will save you so much time and effort. You can see who has made what change and on what day and you know how that had an effect on the length of the document, all of these things. And you do not end up with 65 versions of a document that have weird date formats and like final versions and things added at the end. Another one to avoid at all costs is emailing files. I beg you, please do not email files. Um, this might sound like bad advice, but what you are much better to do is load them to a central repository and then you can email access to that repository. Now, um, this will come up against GDPR issues at some point. So you have to make sure that the repository you use is secure if, you're, if the data that you're storing there or, or anything that you're working with is at all sensitive or personal. So I think there are academic versions of Dropbox that meet the, the GDPR standards. I think Google Drives is probably okay for, for low-level sort of sharing files around or if there's no issues of personal data. Um, SharePoint, if you're working within a sort of Microsoft uh, environment and your university or research institution offers it, SharePoint is good. Do not email files. I will get off my soapbox. There is plenty of time at the end for more back and forth. Um, but I just want to, before we go on to further, point out when to stop documenting. So you do not document or share anything that you do not have a right to document or share. Um, obviously, this means you can't document someone else, what someone else is doing if they have not given you permission to do that. You're not allowed to share personal information on people. So if you're um, working with, with sensitive data, you have to recode it, anonymize it, or create a synthetic version before you can share your files, you know, something like that. Um, do be careful, but ideally this should be covered in any ethical applications that you've done. Um, and it should, there are courses, the UK Data Service runs courses on safe researcher training that helps you identify whether the tables or graphs that you're using accidentally disclose some personal information that, that you shouldn't uh, be sharing. So you can take those courses if, if you're working with sensitive or personal information and, and you want more information on how to be careful there. Um, so maybe if you, if you can, tell me some of the valid reasons not to document or share something in the research that you've done. So maybe was there, um, you know, you're not allowed to report um, rare medical conditions, you know, too frequently because it, you know, it would be identifiable who had, yeah, so sensitive data, essentially, you're not allowed to share, you know, um, lists of people and say, oh, we had so many people who reported themselves as Christian and so many people who reported themselves as Muslim and one person who recorded himself as Buddhist and then for the rest of the documentation, I'll break things out by religion because that Buddhist will be really identifiable. Non-disclosure agreements, also very important. Yeah, you do have to follow the rules that you set out for yourself when you research. So if you've signed a non-disclosure agreement, make sure you understand it very fully but make sure you understand it very fully before you sign it and then abide by its rules. Um, yeah, so there's there's certainly personal data, non-disclosure data. Uh, there's also time. Uh, so there might just be an embargo on something you're not allowed to share yet. Like you have to wait six months or you have to wait until a thesis is published before you can share you know, the data sets or something like that. There are, you know, basically just practical kind of time reasons that might limit how you document or share. So be aware of those. But more importantly, and I think this, this might be encouraging for you, stop documenting when you're spending more time on the on documentation than on the actual work. Now, the amount of time you spend on documentation versus work will shift 
over the course of a project. You might do a lot more documentation at certain parts of the project than you will at others. But if you find you're spending more time on documentation than on work, it suggests the balance is off and there are some things you can do to um, improve it. So automate the boring stuff. Now, this is an encouragement to you to learn how to do some basic programming or um, some basic sort of or, or get a friend that does some basic programming and help and get them to help you um, do some some automation on your project. So, for example, if you have you know, surveys scheduled on so many days and it's in your calendar and you want to record when those took place and how long they lasted, you could copy them out by hand from your electronic calendar or you could export your calendar into, um, you know, a, an Excel file or something. One of those is going to be a lot more work than the other, especially if you're doing this every week for months. Um, use better tools or processes. So this is something that you might have a process that works really well for one project, but when that project scales up to something that's bigger or longer or with more people involved, suddenly the process that you used to use is no longer appropriate. So if you're working in a team of two, you might just call the other person on the phone and say, when is our meeting for this week? How about two o'clock on Tuesday? That's probably fine in a team of two. But if you're in a team of 20, you cannot call all 20 of them and, you know, ask about meetings because you'll end up having to call them all back. So what you want to do in that case is get one of those little scheduling, um, like find a date in common surveys, you know, doodle polls or whatever they're called. That is a better process that suits coming to an agreement between large numbers of people. So if you find yourself climbing the walls with annoyance because it's so difficult to get something done, that's an indication that there's probably a better process out there because the process you're using is not at the right scale. You can, of course, scale back or rescope the project. If you're trying to document, you know, an incredible amount of detail about 500 people, that might just be too big. You can probably document an incredible amount of detail about five or 10 people, but not 500. So rescope the project or, you know, downsize the amount that you're trying to detail about these people, something like that. If you're just up the wall, um, you know, losing your mind because this is all very difficult and you don't know what you're doing and things keep going wrong and you keep losing your files, get some help. And in fact, the computational social science data drop-ins that we do is a good source for that. Just with it, you can sort of check in with us. You can say, I used to do it this way, but now it's not working anymore. Is there a better tool or process? We're there to answer those kinds of questions. We might be able to point out, for example, um, how you can use EndNote to, to work on your reference manager list, save yourself loads of time in if you're working in Word. Or if you want to step it up and move into LaTeX, we can talk to you about the differences with BibTeX and how that works for reference management, pros and cons, why you might want to do it, how much time you might need to spend learning, and how much time you might save by using a different process. So these are useful things. As, as before, you know, ask people for help. Everyone, in theory, should be doing this. And the fact that we're not asking other people, how do you do this? How do you think they do this? What's a better way to do this? The fact that we don't know how to do these things well, and we're not asking other people how they do them indicates that it's just not getting done, which is a real problem, especially in the context of a crisis of reproducibility. So of course, at this point, I'd like to take other suggestions from the audience. If you have a tool that, you know, tracks your, you know, web searches or something like that, and you want to share it with other people, please let us know. Um, just so you know, here are my contact details. Uh, you're welcome to send me an email, contact me on Twitter, 
Occasionally, I do live streams in which I show how to code something on Twitch. It's not very consistent. I'll try to get back into it again this year. Um, and in that case, that's a useful one if you wanted to see actually people who code as a big part of their job are still rubbish at coding. And it can be quite encouraging. Me anyway, I'm rubbish at coding, despite it being part of my job. 